Good morning, good afternoon, church. Let's begin by giving thanks for the offer tree. Almighty God, sustainer of heaven and earth, our provider, beloved of our souls, shepherd of our souls. Lord, we thank you for just taking care of us. We thank you for showing us your sovereignty. We thank you, dear Lord, for this whole season we are in, even amidst all the struggles and even COVID-19. We want to give thanks continuously. And so, Lord, as we have given, Father, be pleased with our offering. And Lord, grant wisdom to our leaders. May they use this money wisely for the expansion of your kingdom. All this we pray in your Son's most precious name. Amen. Once again, good morning, good afternoon, church. A couple of announcements before we listen to this morning's sermon. Uh, first up, neighborhood visitation. Yes, you heard me right. NV Neighborhood Visitation is back. For the month of September, we will be going out to meet our neighbours once again. I think we've had to pause on NV because of COVID-19. But now that uh, community cases are on the low, and I think government are relaxing our measures, so I think now is a good time to reconnect and to find out how our neighbours doing. We are going out with gifts once again, and if you don't know what the gifts are, Go and read a bulletin. I'm not going to mention it here. Go and turn to your bulletins today and you will see what gifts we are giving and to bless our neighbours with during this NV. Uh, more details will be given as time passes. However, the one difference between this NV and other NVs is that this neighbourhood visitation will not be done as a mass, meaning that we will not be coming together as a church uh, as a mass over the long week, over a weekend and then giving out. No, rather we will be decentralising neighbourhood visitation. Uh, there will be schedules for our small groups and our small groups will go forth only as a, as a small group together to our um, blocks to bless our neighbours and to ke- check in with them to see how they're doing. So it's a decentralised mode this time. Once again, await more details as time progresses. Next up, in October, uh, we will be having once again our combined Zoom service on the 4th of October 2020. And this October Zoom service is special because it is our church anniversary. Uh, We are very glad that we can come together and Zoom once again. And for this church anniversary, we will be having Dr. William Wan, an invited speaker, share with us from God's Word as we celebrate God's faithfulness to us, perhaps especially during this COVID season. And to help us consider as well, how can we, amidst everything, be salt and light wherever God has placed us to be? Not just as a church, but even as individual disciples of Jesus Christ. So the difference between this October service is the timing. Once again, the timing is not at 10.30 like September. We are meeting in October, on October the 4th at 11 a.m. Once again, October 4th, 11 a.m., Zoom live service, our church anniversary service. I hope you're looking forward to it. I am. But for right now, let us listen to the word of God being preached to us by Pastor Rick. Over to you, Pastor Rick. Greetings, brothers, sisters, and friends. Welcome to this a sermon series entitled Suffering for Your Sake. This uh, sermon series is based on the last few chapters of the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, and is talking about the last few days of Jesus Christ on earth, the events which leads to his death and his resurrection. Today is the fourth message, is about his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. The scripture passage is Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 46. Before we begin, allow me to pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to know about you, to know about your suffering, to know about your agony. I pray that God, you open our hearts to understand so that today it will not be just a cognitive knowledge but what we learn from you will touch our hearts and transform our life that we will have a personal knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and a growing love and gratitude towards him so let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be found pleasing and it's acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It was a cold winter's night. 
but it was New Year's Eve and people were bracing the coal, gathering at the banks of River Thames and the Tower Bridge in London. They waited with anticipation for the clock to strike midnight in order to witness the spectacular firework fiestas which were ushered in the brand new world of brand new year at the River Thames. Suddenly, there was a loud splash and a man shouted, someone has fallen into the river. A boy, a boy has fallen into the dark icy water of River Thames. Soon, every eye was staring at the black waters of the river. There, they saw a boy, a boy ascending up from the water's deep. The boy struggled to catch his breath. Using all his might, he fought to keep himself afloat. He clung onto a log that floated by, but the river was icy and his strength was quickly fading. There were gaps and screams. The crowd stood helpless, not knowing what to do, as they witnessed the boy about to lose his fight and going to drown. None has the confidence nor the courage to jump into the cold and icy water to save the boy. Just when, just when it seems all hope was lost, suddenly there was yet another loud splash. A man had jumped into the river. The crowd cheered as they saw the man in the river swimming frantically towards the boy. The man held onto the lock with one hand and dog paddled all the way back to the bank. The boy was rescued and the, man, and the people applauded and hailed the man for his act of bravery. Reporters who were actually wanting to cover the firework fiestas turned their camera towards the man and soon the man was surrounded by journalists. He was the center of attraction now. A journalist start, started by congratulating him and asked this question. Tells us, mister, tells us, mister, what makes you jump into the cold and icy water to save the boy whom you do not know? The man, still shivering from the cold, replied, May I ask, who pushed me? Who pushed me from behind? For someone has pushed me from behind, and the next thing I found myself in the river, cold and shivering. I panicked and quickly swam to the lock nearby, which the boy was also holding on. I used the lock as my float as I swam my way back to the shore. What a case of an accidental hero. What a case of an accidental hero. You know, the cross is the central figure or the central symbol of the Christian faith. The cross tells of what Jesus Christ has accomplished to bring salvation to mankind. He suffered and died on the cross, but rose on the third day, purchasing for us the forgiveness of our sins and giving us life eternal. Suppose, what if Jesus was an accidental hero? What if he was arrowed to do the job? He has no choice. What if he did not actually know what he signed up for? He was ignorant of the demand. Now, have you ever experienced someone who said yes to you, but back out later when he finally know the commitment required? Or have you actually said yes to someone else, but only to regret, but it was just too late? For example, someone asked you to go for hiking together. Halfway in the hiking, it was just so tiring that you regretted and you're wondering why you say yes to this person in the first place. Now imagine if Jesus said yes first, but when he was going through the suffering, he regretted, but it was just too late. One event leads to another, he resigned to his fate and he died on the cross ultimately. If this is so, Jesus' death will not be voluntary. This will have made his sacrifice 
not a perfect one. Perhaps this is why the account of Jesus agonizing in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane is an important one. I suggest that it reveals to us that he surely knows what his coming passion will consist of. But yet he prayed, not my will, but your will, the Father's will, be done. So let us read the passage together. Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch me with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 42, Again for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed at the third time, saying the same word again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinner. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is a very, very emotional passage, at least for me. It was after the Last Supper. In the Supper, remember, he instituted the Holy Communion. He even predicted, Jesus, uh, he even predicted Judas would betray him. He washed his disciples' feet. And after singing a hymn, they proceeded to a garden called Gethsemane. He told his disciples to wait for him as he wanted to spend some time to pray. He brought Peter, James, and John to be with him. And he expressed to them and confided with them that he was in deep sorrow, even to the point of death. And then he asked them to join him in prayer. While he proceeded a little further away from them to pray alone. This is a very sobering portrait, an artist's impression of Christ in the garden, collapsing onto the ground due to sorrow, praying in agony. Why was he feeling such anguish and sorrow? Why was he in such agony? Years back, I came across a meditation by Jonathan Edwards that transformed my understanding on the passage we have just read about the Garden of Gethsemane. For some of you who do not know, Jonathan Edwards was a great theologian, a pastor and revivalist in the 1700s. Uh, one of his very well-known and classic sermon is entitled, Sinners Under the Hand of an Angry God. Jonathan Edwards also wrote about the Garden of Gethsemane. It is entitled, Christ's Agony. It is now in public domain. You may want to read it. It's a long meditation. In that meditation, he insightfully explained why Christ was in such agony. And I'll be sharing what I gleaned from this meditation piece. Jonathan Edwards says, that in the garden, Jesus had an extraordinary sense of the pain and the suffering that he would soon be going through. Now, the key phrase here is extraordinary sense. It is a special and profound revelation of the pain and suffering that he will have to go through soon. Now, even before the garden, Jesus already knew of the pain and the suffering that awaits him in Jerusalem. Remember Matthew 16, 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day 
be raised. Then in Matthew 17, when they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day, he will be raised to life. And finally, in Matthew 20, now as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. So even before the garden, Jesus already knew about the pain and suffering that we have to go through in Jerusalem. But Jonathan, suggest, Jonathan Edwards suggests that in the Garden of Eden, there was an extraordinary sense of that pain and suffering, a special and profound revelation. So Jonathan Edwards said, but it seems that at this time in the Garden, God gave him an extraordinary view of it, a sense of that wrath that was to be poured out upon him and of those amazing sufferings that he was to undergo, was strongly impressed on his mind by the immediate power of God, so that he had far more full and lively apprehensions of the bitterness of the cup which he was to drink than he ever had before. And these apprehensions were so terrible that his feeble human nature shrunk at the sight and was ready to sink. So there's special and profound knowledge that God revealed to make him understand what he is going to go through, the pain and the suffering. The pain and suffering of the flogging. How he'll be struck with a whip that's made of braided leather thorns with metal balls woven into them plus, plus pieces of sharp bone. Scholars have suggested that this whip Will, 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 will cause the sufferer's vein to be laid bare and the very muscles and sinews and bowels of the victims will, will be open to exposure. And that Jesus had to endure, endure through a maximum of 39 lashings determined by Jewish law. And some propose that since it's the Roman soldiers who carry this out, they will have given him more than 39 lashes. Jesus had an extraordinary sense also about the crown of thorns that he, is, he will be forced to wear. How this crown will cut into his fragile skin, causing more bleeding around the scalp. Jesus also had the extraordinary sense of how the cross will be. How he will hang on the cross and the nails that will be driven into his hands and into his feet. And so Jonathan Edwards continued to say, he had then a near view of the furnace of wrath into which he was to be cast. He was brought to the mouth of the furnace that he might look into it and stand and view its raging flames and see the glowings of his heat that he might know where he was going and what he was about to suffer. This was the thing that filled his soul with sorrow and darkness. This terrible sight as it were overwhelm him. Wow. Yes, I bring Jesus to the furnace that he's about to be thrown into so that he can feel the heat and realize how painful it will be. Now, I don't know if you have ever, ever have a nightmare that seems so real that when you wake up, you are perspiring, totally wet, and then the dream haunts you for the next few days or weeks. I had those dreams that were so real that I thought it actually happened. You know? But the revelation given to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane about the pain and suffering he was about to go through is more than a nightmare. It is reality, what he will indeed go through. But yet that is not all that was revealed to him. In the Garden, Jesus had an extraordinary sense of the wickedness of men and the unworthiness of those he died for. Again, even before the garden, Jesus already knew how men are so wicked 
and how his disciples are so unworthy. He has his fair share of encounter with the Pharisees and scribes. He also has experienced how his disciples continually fight for prestige and power in front of him. And in John chapter 2, verse 23 to 25, that though it was recorded that though many believed in Jesus' name because of the signs he was performing, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to men because he knew what was in men. So Jesus has a fair share of understanding men are wicked and his disciples are unworthy. However, in the garden, he is given an extraordinary sense of the unworthiness of his disciples. Firstly, his disciples closest to him, Peter, James and John, failed him. They were too weak in their flesh and fell asleep even though Jesus appealed to them to watch with him in prayer. He expressed to him and confided with him that he was deeply sorrowful to the point of death. Imagine somebody come to you and say, I'm in deep sorrow, in deep anguish. And then you, you just say, okay, and then you my own business, or you, you, you fell asleep after that. You know how would it make the person feel? The person who is so sorrowful. And not only that, God will have revealed to him how his disciples will leave him and flee away when the soldiers arrest him. And how Simon Peter will deny him three times before the rooster crow. Imagine, imagine at the Garden of Gethsemane, you've been brought to once again realize how, how weak and how unworthy your disciples were. That you're about to suffer and die for a bunch of ingrats. In his agony, God gave the extraordinary sense of the wickedness of men. How Judas will come with the soldiers, how he will betray him with a kiss, how he will be arrested, bound and brought before various courts to be unjustly tried before his accusers. He was given an extraordinary sense of the wickedness of men on how they will reject him and prefer Barabbas than him and shout, crucify him, away with him. And how wicked men will flock him, lay a cross upon him to bear, nail him to it, mock and ridicule him while he gaps for air on the cross. All this will reveal to him in a special way and deep and profound way. But yet, all this wickedness of men that was revealed to him was but a sample of the wickedness of mankind. For the corruption of all mankind is of the same nature and of the wickedness that is in one man's heart is of the same nature and tendency as in another's. This means Christ has an extraordinary sense of the wickedness and unworthiness of not only those men around him at that time, but of the whole world and throughout history too. And this includes you and me. How many times have we denied him and betrayed him? How many times have we been unfaithful and faithless towards him? How many times have we given him partial obedience, token sacrifices? How many times have we taken him for granted? We are as unworthy as the disciples of Jesus in his time. And Jesus agonized, knowing that he would die for sinners like you and me. So, I hope that now we know why he was so deeply sorrowful, even to the point of death. Verse 37 records, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to his disciples, my soul is very, tr so tr my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Another gospel, it was recorded that his, sweeps were, his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. 
Now, this is a very rare but very real medical condition that causes one sweat to contain blood. Because the sweat glands are surrounded by tiny blood vessels that can constrict and dilate to the point of rupture, causing blood to effuse into the sweat glands. And this cause, the cause of this is extreme anguish. Another gospel recorded that he was so weak, physically weakened by his sorrow, that an angel came to attend to him and to strengthen him. Yet in the midst of this extraordinary sense of pain and suffering, of the wickedness of man and unworthiness of his followers, he prayed this. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. This first prayer started with a genuine and sincere request, a request that reveals that he knows what he's in for. But it ended with a decision, not as I will, but as you will. In his second prayer, he said, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink, your will be done. It is a prayer of commitment. It is to say that Jesus knows that it is the father's will that he has to drink the cup. And he replied, Yes, my father, your will be done. I will drink that cup. The third prayer that's not written here, it's a prayer of confirmation, affirming the second one. It just says, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again, referring to his second prayer. The same words again. Yet not I, but your will be done. Yet not I, but your will be done. This prayer reveals Christ's humble obedience, reverent submission towards God the Father. This obedience that Jesus has towards the Father is a perfect one because he knows what it takes, what it will take to obey God and embrace the cross. It is not an accidental obedience where he don't know what he's in for. He has counted the cost. He is aware of the price he has to pay. He is aware, in fact, he has an extraordinary sense of the pain and suffering, but he did not waver, but still chose to obey. This makes his obedience a perfect one. Not only his obedience is a perfect one to God, but his love, he also reveals about his love. The prayers also reveals that he has perfect love towards sinners and that he is not an accidental hero that jump into the water like the man, not knowing what is taking place. Jesus jumped into the water, knowing what it will really cause him. He has an extraordinary sense of what he will have to endure, both the pain and suffering, and also the weakness and unworthiness of man. But yet, he's willing, he's willing to bear the cross. He loves us so, so much that he's willing to go through the pain, the suffering, the betrayer, the denier, the mocking, the flogging, the crown of thorns, the cross, and the nails for you and I. This is the perfect love of Christ. You know, often when we think of Jesus agonizing in the Garden of Gethsemane, it seems to be a picture of weakness. Jesus at his weakest moment. But I beg to differ. On the contrary, I think Christ's agony in the garden is not a picture of weakness, but of great strength. His agony reveals his perfect obedience to God and his perfect love towards mankind. Wow. But yet it is hard for us to appreciate Jesus' perfect obedience and perfect love unless, until, we realize how much we need his obedience to God and how much we need his love 
towards us. A story was told of an African pastor who had a dream. In a dream, he was transported onto the hill of Calvary. Uh, he was standing at the slope, on the slope of Calvary. And as he was looking down the slope of Calvary, he saw Jesus coming up, going up to the top of the hill, which is the cross. But Jesus was carrying a very huge, a huge rock on his back while he was climbing up the hill. And as the African pastor looked at the rock, he saw that the rock has, an, uh, has a word engraved on it, a three-letter word. And the word is sin, S-I-N, S-I-N, sin. Immediately, the African pastor felt deeply grateful and knelt down and began to weep. As Jesus was climbing up the hill, passing him, he shouted, My Lord, my Lord, thank you. Is this the, the sin of the world that you are carrying? He asked. Jesus turned towards him with eyes of compassion and said, No, my son, this is your sin, just your sin. You know, many times we didn't realize the sin, the sinfulness of our sin. Many of us didn't realize what it takes for Jesus to die for each of our sin. Many of us did not realize the penalty of each of our sin is so grave and so heavy. But yet Jesus died for each one of us, each of our sin. Our sin is so great before God that we are, we will, His enemies. But yet it's because of what Jesus has done on the cross for you and I. That's why we are forgiven of our great sin. My dear brothers and sisters, as you think about Christ's agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, know that He is not an accidental hero. In his uh, agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, it reveals that Jesus exactly knows what he's in for. His obedience is a perfect one. His love is a perfect one. Even though he knows what is to come, yet he prayed, not my will, but your will be done. And we need that prayer. We need him to pray that prayer. And he prayed that for you and I. Brothers and sisters, our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross voluntarily, willingly, because He obeys the Father perfectly and He loves us perfectly. I don't know why we deserve Him to do this, but yet this is what He has done. His agony in the Garden of Gethsemane reveals that he is not an accidental hero. He is Saviour. He is the authentic Saviour for you and I. I want to end this message by reading the lyrics of a beautiful hymn in hope that this will also be your response towards him. Alas, and did my Saviour bleed, and did my Sovereign die, would he devote the sacred head for sinners such as I? Was it for crimes that I have done, he grown upon the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well might the sun in darkness hide, and shut his glories in, when God the mighty maker died, for his own creature, creature's sin. Thus might I hide my blushing face while his dear cross appears. Dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt my eyes to tears. But drops of tears can never repay the depths of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. This is all that I can do. Here, Lord, I give myself away. This is all 
that I can do. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, thank you. Thank you for your perfect obedience to God and perfect love towards each one of us. In the Garden of Gethsemane, you were in deep anguish because you have an extraordinary sense of your pain and suffering and also of the wickedness of men and the unworthiness of your followers, including each one of us. But yet, in the midst of the sorrow and anguish, you prayed, not my will, but your will be done. I cannot imagine, Lord, what it would be if you didn't pray that way. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for us. Thank you for being our Savior, the perfect Savior who died for our sins, willingly, voluntarily. We want to live our life in gratitude and devotion to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you for a wonderful time of discussing the sermon reflection questions.